All right, it is 12 o'clock, uh, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to Medical Grand Rounds this afternoon. I want to remind people, if you have questions for Dr. Kessler as the talk is going on, please put them in the Q&A section of the Zoom feature. Uh, the Chiefs and I will pull those questions out and ask them of Dr. Kessler when the talk is over. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Kessler uh, for Grand Rounds this afternoon. She is a general urinary medical oncologist here at the University of Colorado and an associate professor in the Division of Medical Oncology. She was an undergrad here at Boulder. Uh, she then left to go to medical school in Valhalla at the New York Medical College, came back here for her internship, residency, and fellowship training. Um, and is uh, now a highly accomplished faculty member. She's the director of the Bladder Cancer Research Program. She's also the director of the Supportive Oncology Research Program um, through the General Urinary Oncology Group. She's the medical co-director of the Grampus Urologic Oncology Clinic. And until recently, she was the associate director of oncology services here at UCH, as well as the site director for the UCH Oncology Fellowship Program. She is an active member of the Cancer and Aging Research Group a member of the Palliative Care Research Cooperative Network, a panelist on the National Comprehensive Cancer Network's Adult Older Oncology Guidelines Panel, and the associate editor of the journal Aging and Cancer. Uh, she has had many acknowledgements throughout her career. She was the Johnny Hartford Center for Excellence Junior Faculty Scholar early in her career, and most recently in 2020, she was named uh, one of American Cancer Society's Clinician Scientist Scholars. Her truly excellent work is supported as the PI and America Cancer Society uh, Clinician Scientist Award, which focuses on developing a care planning framework for older adults with cancer. She also works with the Cancer Center on our Aging and Cancer Working Group, um, looking to, uh, as an administrative supplement, to build statewide infrastructure for cancer prevention and control in older populations. Dr. Kessler is going to speak today about delivering uh, goal concordant care to older adults with cancer. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Kessler. Thank you so much. Thanks for that great introduction and thank you again for the opportunity to be a part of today's rounds. So as is mentioned today, we're really going to be talking about delivering goal concordant care to older adults with cancer. I have no commercial disclosures to share related to this presentation and these are the objectives we hope to focus on today. If we think about our patient, our patient's an 81 year old male with a history of atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, peripheral neuropathy, pretty familiar guy. And he presents to his primary care clinic, mainly for standard follow-up and mentions that he's had a single episode of gross hematuria. He's lost about 10 pounds in the last six months. And upon further workup and investigation of this gross hematuria, a CT IVP is ordered that unfortunately reveals a large bladder mass, enlarged pelvic lymph nodes, and a couple little lytic lesions in his posterior ilium. As we learn more about him, we know he doesn't have much significant surgical history. He does continue to smoke about a half a pack of cigarettes per day, which is a cut down for him. He takes eight medications and he sees his primary care physician a couple times a year and, and mentions his cardiologist once in a while. He lives alone, he enjoys golfing. He does have some eyesight changes that make it difficult to see while driving in the dark, but still gets around independently. And he has two children who live locally that he states he speaks with on the phone, um, but doesn't necessarily see regularly. So as we think about this case and how it will apply to today's discussion, we can think about the traditional model of care. And in this way, we oftentimes think, here's how we treat bladder cancer. And that's one bucket that somebody might start from. The other is, here's how we treat older patients. And that might be the other bucket. And what we'll hopefully talk through today is how we put these two things together and maybe grasp a care plan from, from both perspectives. Similarly, instead of trying to choose one branch point or another in talking about, do you wanna live longer or do you wanna live better when we talk about a serious illness, oftentimes posed as a choice between longevity and quality of life, we may talk today about some of the middle ground options. I think that you know, choosing between prolonging overall survival, which is a really common oncologic endpoint, and the choice between improving quality of life, which is often offered as the alternative endpoint, may not be the only two endpoints that are important to our patients or to the science that we're hoping to advance. Many patients actually would like both. 
We also understand that some patients may accept worsened physical health or physical symptoms as measured by traditional quality of life metrics if they had improved um, agency in their care planning process, if they felt that they were really comfortable with the decisions that they were making. Others we know may actually have improved longevity by focusing on quality of life solely um, or symptom management alone. And so there are, I think, other endpoints to be explored. And we'll talk about one of those core endpoints today, which is this concept of goal concordant care. In medical care, we're oftentimes trying to, to strive for caring for our patients in a more compassionate way, improving the evidence base for the care that we provide, avoiding medical errors. And the National Academy of Medicine has listed the achievement of goal concordant care as a priority. Multiple expert panels have also brought this up. And I would posit that this applies to many different types of medical care, not just oncologic care, the care of older patients, but really something that we're continuing to strive for each time we face um, a patient-physician relationship. So the definition of goal concordant care as we apply it to today's talk is listed here. We think of this as care that aligns with patient values and priorities. These are the things that patients share with us as being important, something that really brings them joy or makes their own life worth living. This care must also account for their physical and emotional health. We can't ignore the fact that somebody may be immobile or that they could have end-stage renal disease that compromises their tolerance of particular medical agents. So it really does bring together these more personal aspects of the patient combined with the medical aspects of their emotional and physical health. And then the care is decided upon together. Um, this doesn't necessarily just come down to a physician-patient discussion. Patients oftentimes are bringing in other supportive members of their family or community. Physicians oftentimes work in a care team that includes other clinicians or clinical experts. So this is likely a community decided care plan, but it is decided upon together. While we're talking about definitions, we'll talk a little bit about some of the terms that come up when we have these conversations around goal concordant care, or this even this term goals. You know, I think that oftentimes this is used differently in different clinical scenarios, and it's important to think a little bit about the framework that I'll base this on for today's talk. So we've just spent some time talking about goal concordant care. We'll also discuss goals of care. So as mentioned, these are really the current values, priorities, and um, highly important aspects of someone's life. Really what makes that person who they are. And the goals of care are oftentimes operationally defined as the overarching aims of medical care for that person that are informed by those underlying values and priorities. And they could be established within an existing clinical context and used to guide decisions in that particular clinical context um, about specific medical interventions, but they really do focus on, on that person. Building from that is this concept of advanced care planning, which we'll define today as a process that would support adults at any age or any stage of health in sharing those values, life goals, preferences, and applying that to their preferences regarding future medical care. So the goal of advanced care planning is to ensure that people receive medical care that's consistent with those values, but it oftentimes is looking forward it may result in documentation of a medical durable power of attorney. It may result in um, advanced care directives and CPR wishes. Um, and so oftentimes I do think that some of this is applied to more end of life planning, um, but it is also based off of some of the things we might learn in a goals of care discussion about that person. Something that's a bit different from those three that we've just focused on are goals of treatment. And goals of treatment really are separate from anything that's patient-centered. And what we think about with the goals of treatment are, is this treatment aimed to cure a condition? Is this treatment aimed to palliate a condition, but also potentially offer rehabilitation from symptoms that that condition is causing? 
the goals of treatment are separate from what that person's underlying value structure is, but they can be lined together. So this alignment might be part of the delivery of goal concordant care. And in goal concordant care, this is an adaptation from Tolsky and Street. We can see that really the clinician patient communication improves the patient and caregiver experience to help enable a shared decision making process that mediates the achievement of goal concordant care. And you can see here some of the terms we've just discussed, like advanced directive completion, but really it's this communication process that leads to the achievement of goal concordant care. And that's partly what we'll talk about today. What we'll also add in is what the older patient population brings to these discussions. What's different about this population? What else do we need to be thinking about? What I'll hope to bring it to point is that I do think of them as a unique population of patients that do warrant further consideration when care planning. And that's because we need to consider things like functional status, comorbidities. We also need to consider their malignancy and the biology that that brings. So shifting a little bit to talk about older cancer patients, we know that this is a growing population. We can see here the estimated prevalence of cancer in the US population up to 2040. And what I'll point out is that the green, purple, and turquoise bars represent patients that are 65 to 74, 75 to 84, and 85 plus. And if we look at the rates that these are growing, we can see that those patients that are in the 75 to 84 and 85 plus groups are growing at higher numbers than some of the younger, older population. So our oldest old will grow by significant numbers and we really need to get comfortable understanding what somebody in our clinic exam room who's in their early 80s might need or be asking for that's different than somebody in their early 60s. So we'll get a little bit of an audience response here and see, you know, what according to you all um, makes this population unique. We've got a couple choices here. And we can close the poll. I'm not sure how to see it. Looks like most of you have voted for all of the above, and that's also um, what I would hope you would have voted for. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of these aspects right now, um, but these patients do have limited life expectancy. And so the estimated life expectancy of a person that's faced also with a new serious illness diagnosis such as cancer is extremely important. This cancer diagnosis may not be clinically important for a patient for two years, four years. The average life expectancy with advanced prostate cancer, for example, could be four to six years. But if the patient that's sitting in front of us may have multiple comorbid conditions and other health considerations to where their estimated life expectancy may only be a couple years, that could be a diagnosis that we don't focus on as much. So even though cancer becomes quite a weighted word, we really need to think about the biology of the cancer in reference to this person's estimated life expectancy. Additionally, this population has a higher number of comorbid conditions, a higher likelihood of organ dysfunction since we know that this does change as people age, as well as cognitive considerations and this consideration of functional reserve. If an older person is bed bound for a day or two, this can have a profound impact on their ability to ambulate independently in the longer term. The majority of Medicare beneficiaries have multiple comorbid conditions. And many observational studies have found that cancer patients that have increased comorbidities have poor survival compared to those without comorbidity. And interestingly, this oftentimes is most important in the cancers that we could potentially cure, um, but that those comorbid conditions are 
increasingly um, adding to the risk of severe toxicity and hospitalization during that curative course. Oftentimes in more advanced cases, the tumor biology really trumps everything and the aggressiveness of the cancer may come to play there. Um, but in those earlier stage, we really need to account for comorbidity. I do think that there's a shifting for focus to using the term multimorbid conditions. And so historically, cancer has been thought of as an index condition. And other diseases have been thought of as kind of being satellites to this, you know, focus on the cancer, and then we can get to everything else. Um, but this concept of multimorbidity reflects a model that shows that there are multiple diseases and treatments for those diseases that interact with each other both positively and negatively and need to be accounted accounted for. In cancer care, the presence of comorbidities can influence outcomes. So this is a study of patients with unfavorable risk prostate cancer. I have to add some Kaplan-Meier curves into these. Um, and what you can see here are different subsets. The overall study showed no difference in the group that was randomly assigned to receive radiation treatment alone versus radiation treatment plus a short course of androgen deprivation therapy. But the patients that had no or minimal comorbidities seemed to have a better result when they had the combined therapy, whereas those with moderate or severe comorbidities based off of an adult comorbidity evaluation score potentially were harmed by the combination. This was a post-randomization hypothesis generating analysis, but does point out some of the clinical importance of those comorbid conditions. Similarly, in this graphical representation, we can see the proportion of patients who had a geriatric event while hospitalized for a cancer surgery. This study defined those geriatric events as delirium, falls, pressure ulcers, dehydration, and the top graph shows us the comorbidity scores, and the bottom is adjustments based off of age group. The bars that are gray are either patients with high comorbidity or patients that were greater than 75 years old. And so you can see that just the presence of a different number of comorbidities, again, based here on an age-adjusted Charleston score, could predict for those geriatric events that then unfortunately can lead to complications, longer hospitalizations, and potentially even impact mortality or place of discharge. Interestingly, patients that are in the younger, older groups might cluster together a little bit more, but the comorbidities separate out. So if we can see that this is a unique population, I think as clinicians, we oftentimes think about how to apply information, understanding that we need to have special considerations for our patients in front of us. And we're usually basing this off of an evidence-based, usually trial data, or our own clinical expertise. Luckily, in oncologic care, we continue, I think, to improve the evidence for how to best care for particular tumor types and tumor biologies. And this slide is very busy. In a way, though, it does represent exactly what we think of when somebody is undergoing initial diagnosis and evaluation for a cancer. It's incredibly complex. The patients themselves meet with multiple clinicians. They undergo numerous tests and procedures just to get us this basic biologic understanding. And then the clinician themselves has to say, okay, this is a non-small cell, non-squamous adenocarcinoma of the lung. What are the genomic alterations? Which of these four medications am I gonna choose and why? And then we also know that cancer care is not just limited now to chemotherapy or surgery. We have targeted therapies, immunotherapies. So we continue to advance this science but oncologic clinicians are having to synthesize all of this data while also thinking about this older patient population. So if we look at the oncology trial data, um, we'll ask another question, which is what percent of older adults with cancer enroll on clinical trials? So you guys can all give an estimate of this. All right, let's see what the poll shows, if it's up. OK, 
Okay, so it looks like we've got a little bit more variation in our responses this time. Um, over half of you have uh, chosen less than 10%. About a third of you have gone with 20%. So it seems like the majority understand that we have low representation of these patients in clinical trials. And here, I'm not even narrowing this down to older adults. Of the approximately 1.7 million people diagnosed with cancer each year, only 3% of them um, enroll on therapeutic trials. So if we then think about how this applies to older adults with cancer, we could think about this particular representation by the FDA. And the FDA, I think, has recognized that there is an underrepresentation of patients with cancer in clinical trials and significant underrepresentation in older adults with cancer. So they looked at the 10 year experience of drugs that had achieved FDA approval for cancer treatment. So these were phase three registry trials, and they compared the age of the patients enrolled into those studies with the surveillance epidemiology and end results database, which is basically a cancer um, populational database. And they found that the younger patients were overrepresented in trials and that the oldest old were underrepresented. There's decent representation of folks in this 65 to 74 year range, which is nice. However, I do think that that varies depending on particular tumor type. So again, a busy slide, but I've highlighted here that when different drugs had been reported and we look at the actual trial data, the representation of people that are over 65 or over 75 is quite a low percentage. Oftentimes, the studies don't even report out on the patients that are over 75. And in these other studies, it's a range usually between about 10 and 40%. Some of the studies that are 82%, like here, are prostate cancer trials. Some of our breast cancer trials that use hormone-based therapies may get more older patients enrolled in part because of less concern over toxicity. So if we adapt what we know from trials and think about why are these patients different, we know that the real world versus trial patients tend to be less healthy. In, in the real world, our patients are more diverse and that there may be aspects of the way we've designed these trials that are contributing to this. So the exclusion criteria has come up multiple times in investigating how to increase enrollment of older patients into clinical trials. Oncology trials previously excluded nearly across the board, patients who had any sort of mild organ impairment. So if they had mild chronic kidney disease or hepatic impairment, they were excluded regardless of the pharmacokinetics of the agent under investigation. Additionally, patients who might've had other comorbid conditions such as heart disease or a history of TIA could be excluded, again, regardless of the mechanism of action of the drug at times and patients who had another cancer diagnosis, even if cured and treated, were sometimes excluded. And this was seriously limiting our ability to enroll older patients. And there have been some liberalization of these criteria in newer studies. Older patients have also shared that time, money, and distance play a role. So these patients are oftentimes on a fixed income. They may not have access to transportation or the time that it takes to participate in trials. Similarly, they or their clinicians could have a lack of awareness of these trials. They may not even know it's available or their clinicians may be thinking, well, that could be over treatment for this patient. They're not necessarily fit enough for this. Toxicity concerns come up and even the complexity of trials, how many biopsies are required, what's the window of allowance between treatment visits, how many patient reported outcome measures do they have to fill out. So there is also a consideration to think about how to design these trials in a more pragmatic way, taking the stakeholder input from patients and their caregivers to really ask endpoints that are important to them, as well as design studies that are not too cumbersome, but still give us good clinical data. Moving from trial data back to real world data, here we can see in this graph a representation of patients who have a localized bladder cancer diagnosis. On the x-axis that is increasing age, and then this dark gray bar represents patients assigned to surgery, which would be the standard treatment option. 
radiation in the light gray, and no anti-cancer treatment at all in the white. So these patients have a potentially curative bladder cancer diagnosis, and you can see that as the age increases, the likelihood to be offered therapy with surgery goes down, and the likelihood to have no anti-cancer therapy increases. In our own group, we did some preliminary work looking at the SEER database over a course of three years, and we looked at more advanced bladder cancer diagnosis, so patients who had incurable cancer, and found that only 15% of those older adults received the standardized first-line chemotherapy option and that 60% of them received only supportive measures. And whenever I think through these data and, and the audiences that I'm presenting them to, it brings me back to this concept of goal concordance. Those numbers could be completely appropriate based off of somebody's underlying medical or physical health or based off of their underlying values and priorities. You know, they might learn what the risks of surgery are and the potential benefits and say that's not a procedure I'd like to pursue. However, I do worry that there may be some considerations of over or under treatment that are going on where the clinicians themselves um, may be influencing some of the treatment decisions there. So how do we help clinicians with these decisions? Geriatric assessment exists um, across multiple different healthcare settings, and in oncology, we have standardized tools that assess the risk of decline while undergoing anti-cancer therapy, and these have been supported by multiple agencies. So we'll engage one more time, this is your last question, to think about what are the components of geriatric assessment? All right, let's see what your answers are. Great, so all of the above, you're either really good test takers or you already know everything we're gonna talk about. Um, so really each of these domains is an independent predictor of morbidity and mortality in older adults with cancer. So whether you're investigating somebody's mobility and physical function or even their nutrition, those have independent strength at predicting that person's morbidity or mortality. The geriatric assessment can be compiled though into fully assessing that patient to really try to understand who fits into an at-risk category. So we're looking at the state of vulnerability to stressors that could lead to adverse health outcomes. About a third of the patients will be fit, meaning that their chronologic age could say that they're in an older category and might be at risk, but their physiologic function or their physiologic age says that their, their fitness is of a younger age and that they could likely tolerate anti-cancer treatment without modification. There's gonna be a small group that are frail. They have no adaptive capacity or resiliency and that even sometimes the diagnosis of the cancer itself is such a stressor that any anti-cancer treatment would potentially cause irreversible harm. But the majority of these patients are gonna fall into this pre-fail or vulnerable category. And what we're trying to do is uncover those patients and see if we could modify either the therapy itself or the supportive measures in place to help improve outcomes for those patients. And that's through this geriatric assessment. So it evaluates the functional and social status and trials incorporating geriatric assessment have been shown to identify problems that are not routinely found in clinical care. So our usual oncology performance status measures or assessment of how many falls somebody has had do not uncover these and that these in interventions based off of geriatric assessment input can improve quality of life, improve function or maintain function, and that survival sometimes can remain unchanged despite decreasing the risk of toxicity. Bringing this back to our patient, you know, he shares his interest in evaluating his cancer. He says, I, I do want to learn more about this and potentially treat it because he really prioritizes extending his lifetime as much as possible to continue golfing and get to the next golf season. And he asks you to, you know, give me whatever you have, just get rid of this, but how risky is it going to be? So a, a general clinician who's not in a geriatric oncology clinic can use one of these screening tools to try to assess somebody's risk and the potential that they need a more comprehensive evaluation. 
This is an example of the G8. It's been validated to identify geriatric impairments that may require a more comprehensive assessment. And it's also been shown to independently predict survival or mortality. It has a cutoff score of 14. So a score of zero means you're heavily impaired. 17 is no impairment, but at a score of about 14, some people might argue 11, you could then consider referring for a more comprehensive geriatric evaluation. Similarly for our older patient, when he asks you what chemotherapy is gonna bring in terms of risk, if we know that we can't necessarily go to that trial data and pull out the adverse event reporting and see how that would apply to him, we can use some of these prospectively validated um, chemotherapy toxicity tools. And this is an example of the Cancer and Aging Research Group tool in which it predicts for the likelihood of grade three to five, so pretty serious or life-threatening toxicities due to chemotherapy based off of patient-specific lab values, the treatment-specific decisions the tumor type, et cetera. So in geriatric oncology, I think that we've identified that these tools exist, that they can help, um, but really we're learning more and more about what outcomes they might influence. And then shifting back to one of the main topics of our discussion today, you know, how does this help inform goal concordant care? And again, think about that goal concordant care as understanding the values the health of the patient, and that's where the geriatric assessment might come in, and then that communication that leads to the aligned care plan. The measurement of this is a challenge scientifically. There are theoretical, methodological, and logistical challenges. And currently, the methods are quite limited and oftentimes reported in end-of-life scenarios. So these are mainly reported in situations towards the end of life where we're really looking at how somebody's death might have aligned with their end of life wishes. One method is a patient's report on communication quality. Yes, my doctor discussed these things with me. I felt well informed, feedback in that way. There's also methods to compare what a patient has prospectively shared with what actually occurs. And again, that might be through advanced directive modalities. And then there are retrospective assessments where bereaved caregivers might be able to tell the scientists or researchers, yes, my loved one received um, care that was concordant with their goals or discordant with their goals. Thinking back to the Tolsky conceptual model, we do know that communication plays a foundation in goal concordant care delivery. And really thinking about its occurrence, when it's happening, is it happening early enough, is very important. Uh, here, when we think about patient-centered communication in cancer care, we know that communication can influence multiple aspects of the care plan and lead to differences in health outcomes. We also know that we're dealing with people. And here is an example of a survey of internal medicine residents um, in a medical residency, internal medicine residency program, and they rated their communication skills. And then patients rated their communication skills. And you can see that this is a scatter plot. There's no clear diagonal line showing us that people know what they're talking about and they know how well they are at communicating. The good news is we can learn and we can improve, but I do think that it's hard to rely on communication alone. Similarly, some folks have demonstrated that most cancer patients desire to be a part of their care planning process and involved in that communication, but there have also been concerns that older patients with cancer might have different communication preferences. We performed a descriptive qualitative pilot study with 10 patients and caregivers who had experiences with a recent diagnosis of advanced incurable bladder cancer. And the mean age of our participants was 74. They were about three to 17 months from diagnosis with advanced disease so that they could really kind of think about what those early visits felt like and looked like for them. And some key themes came out of this work. Really the significance of the phrasing and communication from their oncologists and the oncology team. You know, they were looking for key terms or key words. And if it wasn't said or was, that was almost like a subtext of what their care plan would look like. They also very 
very clearly expressed um, the desire for clear expectation setting about prognosis and treatment. So they were not looking for a paternalistic model where they would defer to the cancer team. Um, instead, they wanted to be able to learn more and be involved in that as well as the role of others in their care decisions. So some really shared their desire to have family and friends participate in visits so they wouldn't miss things or so that other aspects of their care could be advocated for. And others really appreciated the opportunity to go and receive care without feeling like they had to burden other family members. They also valued particular traits in care communication. But overall, I'd say from this work, the sense was that they did want to be involved in the communication process. So building from that communication process, this is an experience out of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and they created an entire program. So they had a conversation guide, patient-facing materials, they did training sessions with the participating clinicians, the electronic healthcare records screened patients and even had a documentation template in the EMR. And this, these graphs represent some of their secondary endpoints. So they wanted to see that by enrolling patients and clinicians who had an advanced cancer diagnosis, were they improving on the timing of these discussions of serious illness? And they certainly did. Those discussions were held earlier so that hopefully the care plan could become aligned at an earlier point and not just towards the end of life. The discussions of values and goals, of prognosis and illness understanding were also markedly improved in the intervention group. And so this brings me to that residency scatter plot. We do know that by giving clinicians tools, we can improve our communication skills. No one is a naturally gifted communicator who goes through every interaction with zero mistakes. There's always things that we could do a bit better. And some of these guides can just help give us a little bit of that scaffolding or support to be able to lean back on some key phrases and respond to some of our patients appropriately. Even with these guides, we still know that these conversations are infrequent. They can be occurring late in the serious illness course. They're oftentimes limited to just a particular question and they're hard. And even when they are happening, our patients may not always hear us in the same way that we think that we're communicating. So this pie chart here represents patients who had been diagnosed with an incurable cancer they were enrolled on a supportive oncology trial at a single institution, and they were asked what the goal of their therapy was, and they were also asked to rate what they thought their clinician's goal of their therapy was. And interestingly, despite the fact that most of all of these patients had incurable cancer, here in the orange and the green are the groupings where the patient thought that their treatment was curative, but they knew their oncologist did not, or that the patient thought that their treatment was curative and also thought that their oncologist goal of therapy was to cure their cancer. And these are patients who had had discussions of serious illness and there was still some discordance about what they were maybe hearing or hoping to hear in enlisting here. Similarly, in older patients admitted to an ICU, their surrogate decision makers shared if they wanted their care to be primarily comfort focused, life sustaining or something intermediate. And many of these patients had at least one or more medical treatment that was discordant from what the surrogate's idea of the goals of care would be. Many times here it was primarily code status, where that was listed as a full code when the surrogate had expressed a desire for comfort-focused care. And I think that brings up some of the nuances that come to these communication episodes. Moving beyond the methodology that just focuses on communication, we'll talk a little bit about really this other aspect of goal concordant care, which is, you know, how do we know that we're doing it? Even if we're communicating well, how do we know that the care received is in line with that person's health and values and priorities? So coming back to the serious illness study, again, I mentioned that those graphs that were purple and gray represented secondary endpoints, and their primary outcome was 
the receipt of goal concordant care and peacefulness at the end of life. They created this life priority survey because there were no existing validated tools. And so they looked at both literature um, review as well as patient engagement and stakeholder input and created a priority survey of things that folks had shared as being really important to them. And they asked patients to both rate these as saying, yep, these are these are important, not as important, less important, and then to rank them where they really had to say, pick your top three. And what they found is that there was oftentimes variability in the way that things were rated and ranked so that something rated quite highly might not be ranked in the top three. And so in this trial, Patients who had the intervention where they had these discussions of serious illness, they were able to talk through it and prognosticate, they really were not able um, to then find that their care was goal concordant based off of this ranking system. The authors were surprised by this, given the improvement of that communication aspect of the intervention. So they went back to look through their data and potentially offer some hypotheses as to why this might have occurred. And really what they found is that when you ask someone to rank, that's going to be a much more concrete answer than the ratings. And they weren't sure that they were learning extra information from the ratings, but that it was disrupting their statistical analysis. They also found that you know, if somebody had mentioned being physically comfortable, they might have extrapolated that to being pain-free. And sometimes, unfortunately, we just cannot relieve all pain for our patients. And so another question that might be important to ask would be, well, how much effort was made to include what matters most to you in choosing what to do next? Meaning, was, was your care team really working on your pain? So I think that one thing that's learned from this is that we still have a little bit to go in moving beyond assessing just communication to try to getting to this alignment and getting to alignment earlier on in the disease process. So Dr. Halpern has also offered some methodology suggestions saying, what if we had a documented care plan or goals of care in the electronic health record in our EPIC health record now, we do have the ability to even just jot down somebody's values and priorities in the advanced directive section. It doesn't have to be tied to a formal document. And so that then can help us to understand really where these patients are coming from with their care planning decisions. And then a goals assessment can occur. And these goals, as you'll see, bring about some of the more nuanced decisions that patients are faced with. You know, in this case, it might be being around for an important life event, prioritizing being alive to witness a wedding in eight months. So in this instance, the patient isn't talking about longevity in the big picture or, you know, um, quality of life. They're really saying, I'm going to sacrifice or balance those two because I have a, a particular date I'd like to get to. And so this person might have multiple hospitalizations, um, but still make it to that eight month event. Someone else might prioritize comfort and avoiding burdensome treatments. And so in that instance, this person may die the very next day surrounded by friends and family in a very comfortable setting. And again, looking here to see how the care aligns and how well it brings back to this uh, documented goals is quite important. This model relies on making sure that we document a baseline measure of the patient's goals having these discussions early, having this information available to care teams in multiple care settings. It doesn't completely account for how those goals might change in different clinical scenarios. And so there could be some misclassification, but it at least gives a starting point. And then, you know, I do think that allows us additional prospective ways to see if this care aligns. We mentioned also that there are logistical challenges. Really, we've talked for a while, we, me, um, about <laughs> tools that are available to clinicians and to the healthcare system. And we've got geriatric assessment tools, we've got chemotherapy toxicity tools, we've got conversation guides, but these tools are not easily implemented. They're out there and people aren't accessing them. And this is an example of a survey put forth to ASCO members, um, that's our 
clinical oncology organization. And of the 1,300 respondents, only 53% of them were aware of the existing and published ASCO geriatric oncology guidelines. Of those that were aware, they offered that there were barriers to actually performing geriatric assessments that really relied on more um, implementation and feasibility aspects. So a lack of time, a lack of support, and that those that were unaware of the existence of the guidelines mainly cited knowledge or uncertainty as reasons to not implement them. What you'll notice though, is that over here on the right, there was not a concern about the level of evidence. So really very little concern that there was enough evidence to support the use. And there was more barriers to thinking about how do I adapt this into my current clinical practice. So putting together a lot of the information that I've shared with you all today, we designed the ABC123 care planning framework. And ABC stands for Advanced Bladder Cancer. And it incorporates three core pillars of geriatric medicine, oncologic care and palliative care. And instead of focusing solely on communication, it's focusing on aspects of patient-centered care that create a system that's responsive to patient-centered care delivery. So saying, let's bring this to more of a systems-based aspect to make sure that every patient receives at least basic patient-centered um, care that could lead to goal concordance, regardless of the communication skills of their care team. And we're designing this with plans for future implementation and dissemination to try to get across some of those logistical barriers. And with the hopes that this could be adapted to other patient populations into other care environments. When we look at ABC123, patients will enter as they have a new diagnosis of advanced bladder cancer. Anything here in the orange are kind of standard visits, and those in the green are ABC123 visits. So a patient meets with the oncologist and they think about the tumor biology, treatment options, etc. And the oncologist will certainly get to know the patient in their standard fashion. In the ABC123 visit, they'll also undergo measured physical function to really uncover some of those um, other functional deficits that could exist. They'll undergo a geriatric screening evaluation and a chemotherapy toxicity calculation. And that information will be available to the oncologist. Patient will then be able to come and have a guided goals of care discussion about their baseline values, priorities, um, and what's important to them in life and in care. And that again will be shared with the oncologist. And this may allow the oncologist to use that information in their care plan recommendation. And it may also allow the patient to um, come up with additional questions or thoughts about how they want to approach their care with the hope that this will keep in mind these aspects of goal concordant care. We're going to measure goal concordant care um, in a fairly novel way, again, because I think there's no gold standard and that certainly many of the experts in the field are struggling to figure out the best way to test this. So we will test alignment and perceived goals of treatment. Does the oncologist say that the care is directed at rehabilitation and the patients say that the care is solely comfort focused? Are they in alignment and understanding the goals of treatment? We'll also use mixed methodology to perform some guided qualitative interviews based off of some of those value discussions and understand a little bit about what the decision process has been like for the patient and caregiver as well as follow them beyond that decision into their care and see how things might have changed or remained stable. And we'll perform some quantitative surveys to still get at this aspect of communication quality. So we'll ask about advanced illness coordinating care through a survey that has six core factors that reflect on you know, how the interaction with the care team went. And we'll also use some of the decision-making tools that exist to learn about the patient's experience. You know, what's their self-confidence in their ability to make a decision? How clear do they feel in understanding the benefits and risks and side effects and what matters most to them? And so hopefully through looking at this from a mixed methods lens, we can fill in some of those gaps of, you know, how are these decisions being made about care? and offer some additional methodology to really help us to better understand not only how we're delivering goal concordant care, how to do that, but also how to measure and improve upon it. 
So if we come back to our patient, you know, he has his measured uh, function in the clinic, chemotherapy risk calculation. He brings his family in for a, a guided goals of care discussion. And then through discussion with the oncologist, he does pursue slightly modified chemotherapy. The future goal to come from all of this would ideally be that cancer care for each person is based on a mutually set goal that incorporates that whole person. We stage the cancer. We can't ignore cancer biology, um, but we do need to understand that to have these discussions. We also stage the aged person in front of us using these geriatric tools we have and document a discussion of serious illness, probably using a guide. And then we communicate that treatment plan together and, and share that both with the patient, family, and rest of the care team. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Dr. Kessler, thank you very much uh, for that excellent talk. And there are uh, more questions than we have time for, but we'll get into a couple of them. So one of your mentors, Dr. Flegg, uh, is on and, and wants to know, with this approach, what are your additional thoughts about the time necessary to that needs to be allotted to accomplish these goals um, and, and some of the challenges in, in um, overcoming some of the other barriers to implementation? Yeah, I mean, time is one of the aspects that those um, clinicians in the ASCO survey uh, r recognized as a barrier. I think that many of these screening tools really can be done quite quickly, and, and much of them are also patient um, directed. So patients can fill those out and they can be available to the clinician in the exam room to be able to act on ahead of time without having to go through a burdensome assessment. Those patients that do need more of a comprehensive geriatric assessment, um, I think is where another aspect of the healthcare system is, is falling down for some folks. You know, how do they refer them to a geriatric clinic when we know that there's um, Kind of limited geriatric specialists that exist. Um, and really what it is becoming is that in comprehensive cancer care, I think we understand that there are occupational therapists, dietitians, other people who have aspects of expertise that could be applied to older patient care, and that really will be overlapping some of those skill sets to overcome some of the time barriers on the clinician side. Now, a related question from a, a different audience member is, is what's the reimbursement for this kind of activity? And, and do you think it's going to change in the future? Yeah, there's no specific reimbursement for the particular, you know, tools or assessments. I do think that if we, if we look at the current reimbursement model where we can be reimbursed for the time spent on overall patient care. So that can include reviewing the chart, communication, communicating with other, you know, family members or clinicians, um, documenting these aspects of care. Um, we, are, we are already seeing a change to be reimbursed for that time rather than necessarily needing to just put in particular ICD-9 codes. There's already some coding for having discussions around palliative care and serious illness. And then, um, you know, I think that the reimbursement aspects, again, will come through on the preventative side. So trying to prevent hospital admission, emergency room visits, and less so on that clinical side. The geriatric assessment prospectively in some studies has reduced emergency room visits by 40% um, or reduced those significant chemotoxicities by 10 or 20%. And if we think that those are patients that are at risk of ER visit or hospital stay, there is a return on investment in that way. Makes great sense. A uh, question from Dr. Claudet. On, on the intake forms for all of our clinic patients, patients are asked if they have frequent falls. Uh, is there a protocolized response to this answer or is it just one more piece of information that's gathered from the patient? Um, there is not a protocolized response in many clinics to that answer. Um, I do think that it's, it's part of other accreditation aspects to ask about falls and, um, and that when we do see even just gathering the falls data in like the ECOG or um, Karnofsky performance status, we're still missing some of the other screening aspects in, in geriatric health. Uh, another audience member is wondering, what does this look like in your clinic? Uh, since this is something you think about a lot and you deal with this population on a daily basis, what does goal concordant care look like in your clinic? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I mean, I think that 
like many folks, we always think about how we could improve upon it. Um, we did, we've had um, attempts at having patients fill out full geriatric assessment tools. So there's a group of collaborators across the country that use um, a cancer and aging resilience evaluation that includes a little bit more in-depth data beyond a screener. And when we were giving that to every patient over 65 that was coming into the clinic, they were finding it impossible to complete on time. And, and they themselves were finding that it was quite burdensome. And so now I think that in my own clinic, um, I do do the chemotherapy toxicity calculation. I'll oftentimes check that just to kind of double check myself on the assessed risk for some folks. And oftentimes patients are not necessarily asking for that information, but we do have it ava available for them. Um, the G8 is a very simple tool or the VES 13 is another that I'll, um, I'll usually discuss with somebody that has already through their usual um, history taking shown potentially some vulnerability. But in my own practice, I'll always include assessment of ADLs, IADLs, how independent they are in all of those. We'll review their medication list um, and we'll do a simple physical function assessment just in terms of getting up and out of a chair or, or watching the gate speed to see. We're working to get it yeah. more broadly incorporated across many clinics, not just here at CU, but across the state to find out what works best in different clinical environments. And a related question, how often do you repeat these assessments since functional status and goals and things like that, of course, change across someone's illness? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that could be broken into how often is it repeated, both in terms of uh, clinical research as well as in clinical care. And in clinical research, there's hardly any longitudinal data of, of how this might change, um, especially related to the, the goals of care's discussion. Um, as I mentioned, most of those are really um, documented at a finite point of time, oftentimes at the end of life, in really looking to see if this person's final days were concordant with their goals. Um, we will be collecting longitudinal data in the ABC123 on how that might change along the way. And we'll look at both at the time of the decision, one month, three months, six months later, understanding that the treatment path really could change in that timeline. Um, the geriatric assessments really can be a those have been reevaluated both before therapy, post therapy, um, and then if they're continuing on a therapy uninterrupted, they're usually repeated about once a year. Great. Uh, slightly different question. Is there, given that a lot of these cases prior to treatment go to a tumor board, is there a geriatrician on the tumor board that helps with these older oncologic patients? There is not a geriatrician on the tumor board right now. Um, and I think in geriatric oncology, there are multiple uh, ways that that care is delivered. So there could be a, an inpatient consult service. Certainly here at UCH, we've got the ACE service that isn't a consultative service, but I think does really delve into some of these uh, conditions that are more specific to older patients. Um, there can also be a specific geriatric oncology clinic. And then this tumor board model has not yet taken off at multiple centers, but it has been posed as a really good way to get additional input. Also beyond just a geriatrician, I think many patients have primary care clinicians that really understand their underlying health conditions to a great degree and could offer a lot of input in those multidisciplinary conferences. But oftentimes I think the standard is, oh, this person was fit this was how they looked. Um, and we do, we are trying to be a bit more scientific in, in that assessment of the fitness and frailty. Makes great sense. And in the last minute or two here, I wanted to steal a question because you, you trained here, you've obviously been incredibly successful. What was your journey to this? Did you know that you wanted to be an oncologist when you were in medical school and as a resident, as a fellow, did you know that this was gonna be your path and your research forward? No, not at all. Um, <laughs> I, um, I have generally felt comfortable talking with 
people about serious illness. And so I really strongly considered oncology care versus pulmonary critical care. And the tumor biology was just so fascinating in oncology that um, I really gravitated towards that patient group and the treatment possibilities there. And similarly, um, having heard from both Drs. Flagg and Glaude, um, part of the reason that I really became interested in genital urinary oncology was because of the great mentorship team. Um, so the ability to learn from really wonderful doctors um, was something that was hard to pass up. And as I learned more about the GU population specifically, I really became more aware of the fact that we don't know a lot about how to take care of older people. We kind of make it up, use our clinical gestalt, and that as the cancer treatments become more complex and this population ages, we probably need to get a bit smarter about it. Um, and I used to think about, okay, how do we avoid under treatment or over treatment? But in talking to our patients, sometimes they're okay with extra side effects if you know they feel like they're quote unquote fighting their cancer. Um, and so really trying to figure out, okay, how do we better align with them? And I think for me, just learning from our patients along the way and seeing scientific questions that come from that has been the most exciting part. That's great. Well, Dr. Kessler, thank you for this presentation, for the wonderful research that you're doing um, and for sharing this with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you.